thank you for such a kind an introduction. Before I start, I'd just love to say a big thank you for the welcome and the kindness I've had from yesterday and today, from everyone connected with NITEC and the wonderful people who I met last night. I will travel back home to Glasgow tonight with a smile on my heart. It's been absolutely lovely, so thank you. Uh, back in Scotland, I work on a little project, project called Dementia Care of Voices. And it's funded by the Scottish Government and from this year by Fiona McQueen, the Chief Nursing Officer in Scotland. So I report twice a year directly to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and twice a year from this year to the Chief Nursing Officer. But it's based on a campaign and to harness the work of a campaign that I started in my bedroom when I was caring for my mum. So I'll not, I'll not be speaking about the ins and outs of the project today. There's lots more information at the links on the slides. I'll actually, I've been asked to come and speak about how we got to that point. It will be a very personal experience. I also know that one in three of us at some point in our lifetime will have a family member, a neighbour or a friend who is living with dementia or has lived with dementia. And if anyone's uncomfortable with anything that I say to you and needs a wee bit of time, that's absolutely okay. I find it really difficult to listen to anyone else speaking about their mum or their dad at events and often I have to reflect. But we're surrounded by friends and colleagues eh, and the warmth I felt last night, that will keep you okay today. But it feels really important to me as a son to have an opportunity today to speak on a day such as this and I truly hope it's important to you. <coughs> so my name's Thomas Whitelock and I was a full-time carer for my kind and beautiful and magnificent mum, Joan. My mum passed away on the 22nd of September 2012 and my mum had vascular dementia. And I cared for my mum at home from 2007 until the day my mum passed away. I went back to Glasgow to visit my mum in 2007, not because of dementia or to become a carer. I had no clue what dementia was. And I certainly never knew who or what a carer was. I was going home for my own reasons. For the 25 years previous to that, I worked in the music industry. And I was getting a bit burnt out and disillusioned and making far too many mistakes. And that was some of the reasons I was going back to Glasgow to see my mum. The other reason, I think, is the same reason that most sons and daughters go back to their mum or dad if they're still there. My relationship had broken down. And amongst being burnt out and disillusioned and making these mistakes, I'd messed up another relationship. But that's the first place you go to. No matter how young or old you may be, you go back to your mum or dad if they're still there. Because they make it better. And they take time to listen. And they help you understand the mistakes you're making. And they help you back onto the path you may have stumbled from. That's what mums and dads do. And that's what I was doing in 2007. Go back for my mum to do what she'd done so many times before in life. To put her arms around me and help me make life feel a wee bit better. But before coming back and from a distance, people had started to get in touch and make contact with me to say that they were becoming concerned about my mum. And in their own words, my mum's behaviour. Now she thought maybe my mum's maybe getting a wee bit older and doesn't want to do the kind of things she used to do or go to the kind of places she used to go. But in coming back, things had changed. And they were going to change continually and consistently for the next nearly six years. And when I first came back, it was still all about and for me. I'd made the decision to take a two or three month break from my job and go back to the city I grew up in and be in the house I grew up in and sit in that city that I felt safe in. And I thought I'd find out what people's concerns are about my mum so that I can put things in place and keep a better eye on my mum even from a distance when I returned to work. But those three months became six months, became nine months and then became a year. And within that year, my mum was diagnosed with vascular <coughs> dementia. A really lonely diagnosis that set the theme and the standard for much of it way ahead. With neither of us quite understanding what was happening within, around the beside us, and both becoming isolated from the kind of lives we used to know. People who used to phone my mum didn't phone her as often. People who used to pop in for a wee gossip and a chat and a cup of tea stopped popping in for a cup of tea. And there was two of us becoming quite lost lonely and scared. And in fact, it took other health issues to get a diagnosis. It took my mum being rushed into the hospital in the middle of one night for a diagnosis to be had. 
And after two weeks, as my mum was being discharged, someone sat us down in this tiny room for five minutes and explained my mum had dementia. I told us someone would contact us at home very soon. But no one ever got in touch. And that started the, the path and the foundations for the road we would walk for the next years. And within that first year, finding my mum writing her name on her arm to try and remind herself who she was. And finding scraps of paper in her pocket and underneath her pillow with my name on it to try and remind her who the other person in her own house was. There was two of us walking towards a crisis of our lives. And that fear, that fear that was often a companion in my mum's eyes of all these changes and often the environments that we were in. In fact, in trying to get some help one day, someone wrote their clipboard beside my mum's name, the word challenging. And I think that's a dreadful word to use. I think we have to be careful how we discuss and describe each other. I think language is crucial and critical in everything that we do. If I say to you that person in that ward or that bed or that house is quite challenging, before you met them, you'll probably walk towards them expecting to be challenged. But if I let you know that that person's just really scared of all the things that are happening within and the environment they may be in, I know that one way or another you'll go towards that person and find out what is making you scared today and what can I do to help take that fear away. I think language is crucial and critical in everything we do. And one night at the end of that first year as my mum was going to bed, she grabbed my arms tightly and asked me not to leave her. So I tried to make my mum a promise at her. A promise that's made to us by our governments, by our health force, by our local authorities, by the communities that we live in. That to be cared for for as long as possible in our own homes is the best place to be cared for. If I was married with three children, my answer may have been much different that night. But it was only a year before I came back for my mum to put her arms around me. And I didn't want to leave her the first time ever in her life that she asked me to try and put my arms back around her. But after the second and the third year, as dementia was doing everything within its power to try and affect my mum's greatness. Never to be, never in my eyes, and never in my heart. But to affect her greatness. To affect her being included, listened to, discussed, described, any more eyes Joan Whitelaw. Now in situations and circumstances we've both been in all through our lives, now hearing my mum being described by a condition, or the wee woman in bed six has dementia, or there is, or there is, or that is. But that wee woman had a name, and a life, and a love story within her, and standing right beside her as a son, holding her hand. And becoming isolated from a community that my mum was born in, and grew up in, and went to school in, got her first job in, fell in love in, got married in, and brought her children up in. There was two of us now in that, the crisis of our lives. In fact, for the last of that third year, I'd wake up most mornings and put the quilt back over my head and just lie in my bed and cry for help. I have no clue what to do. I don't know how to do it. How do I keep my mum safe? How do I keep her recognised for her beauty, her kindness, everything she has been and still has a chance to be? And I got up one day and just couldn't do it anymore. Tomorrow felt so far away that we were never going to reach it or touch it or be included in it. And I don't know if that's because I didn't know how to ask for help, or who to ask for help, or the people we were trying to ask for help weren't quite listening. But a culmination of all those things left us feeling quite helpless and hopeless in our own. And I really didn't know what to do. And one of the things I started doing was writing a wee blog. And I felt better. And the night when my mum went to bed, I'd write about the things that brought us love, made us smile, brought us opportunities. The things we understood, the things we didn't understand, the things that made us feel safe or the things that made us feel scared. I don't even know if anybody was reading my blog, but it actually didn't matter. I just felt for the first time I could tell people what it felt like to feel stupid and lost in our own. But I wanted to find out how other people managed. If I could find out how other people managed, I could copy them and I could be a good son. Or I could be a good carer, but ultimately I could always get my mum recognised for her name, her life and her opportunities. So on my blog I made a promise if I could get a week's respite within six months time from then that I would walk around Scotland for a week. Not to raise money, but to ask people to write and share their experiences with them. 
And if people would share them, I would walk straight to the Scottish Parliament and ask them to read them. Never is a protest, never is a petition, always is my mother's son. I arranged to meet people at bus stops, train stations, church halls, supermarkets, car parks, their front doors, community centres, anywhere I could get to during that week. And people started writing to me, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and now about thousands and the thousands. From Scotland, from Wales, from Northern Ireland, from England, from America, from Australia, from all around the world. And every single letter that I've received to this day is about love. It's about the day two people met and set eyes, set eyes upon each other for the first time and thought, I'm going to love you for the rest of my life. It's the love for a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, all those beautiful and remarkable relationships that every one of you walked through this door with today. Because every one of you is beautiful, you're unique, and you're remarkable, and your story should matter to everyone who plays a part in it, no matter how big or small that part may be. Once we walk through the doorway to somebody's story, we have a duty to play the very best part that we can. But the word love is outmatched and outnumbered in every letter by the word loneliness. The word loneliness appears more often in the words isolation and the words understanding. I don't understand what's happening to me or we as a family, we don't understand what's happening to us or people that we meet. Really good people with good intentions don't seem to understand who we are, who we have been and who we still have a chance to be. That part of my campaign which is still ongoing is called Letters, Life and Love Stories. And there's hardly a day goes by when someone I've never met doesn't send me a story about someone they love. Normally at this point I would show you a very short film about that walk and you would get to meet some of the incredible families reading from their letters. You'd get to meet John speaking about the girl he met at school at 14 and he fell in love with her and he married her at 18 and 47 years later when he took it to a care home and he doesn't know how to breathe. But my campaign for last year and this year is called You Can Make a Difference. I'm doing 597 talks in 29 months around the country. This is talk 558. I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm doing a talk in a different hospital, university, college, care home, hospice, community centre. Anywhere the MD is kind enough to invite me, help me get there and help me get back home. And I'm asking everybody I meet, is there just one little thing that you can do to make a difference in your workplace, your community or your family? For the people you live beside, you work beside, you care beside. Because it's people that change lives. It's people that make a difference. Over and above policies and strategies and my PowerPoint shows. And it's people that make a difference. So it's people that make it the most beautiful letter to read. You read that letter and you think, I am so glad you met that nurse today, that care assistant, that doctor, that neighbour, that volunteer, that friend. I'm so glad it was that person who knocked on your front door. It's also people that make it very difficult for us to read. Why did you have to meet that person today? Sometimes I read the letters and think, if I could just take the nurse from this letter and just drop them into this letter over here, what a different story that would be. And no matter what your role is and no matter what you do across this beautiful city, you have the potential and the opportunity to transform the lives and the experiences of the people that you care for. I mean, what an incredible role to play. What an incredible gift to have that something in your heart told you one day, I'm going to apply to that university or that college or that hospital or that clinic or that care home or that community. I'm going to absorb all that knowledge and all that training, but wrap it up with the reason, the reason for me, the reason I wanted to do it in the first place, because of the person that I am. But that gift that I know this room is absolutely full of today, I think it becomes the most noble and beautiful and remarkable gift of all when you share it with others. When you share it with the people you work beside, when you share it with their mums, their dads, their brothers, their sisters, their sons and their daughters. That's when the gift that this room of food is full of becomes the most beautiful gift of all. And that was the same in caring for my mum. It's people when my mum was in the hospital, as that nurse or care assistant walked away from my mum's bedside, I'd sit there and think, I am so glad you spoke to us today. I'm so glad you took the time to spend a wee minute with us. I don't feel as scared as I did before I met you. 
As people when we needed more help at home, as lonely as we felt, I'd stand at the window and watch them walking down the path and think, I am so glad you came in our house today. Not only do you have you helped me make it through today, you've also shown me a way to try and make it through tomorrow. But it was just sometimes when my mum was in hospital, I'd sit there thinking, I honestly hope you're not working tomorrow. Not quite sure how that conversation went. It was just sometimes as lonely as we felt, I'd stand at the window and think, I honestly hope you never knock on my mum's front door again. Because if my mum knocked in your front door, she'd have treated you every bit of dignity and kindness and care she possessed within her heart. It's people that do it. I came back in 2007 for my mum to put her arms around me. And within five and a half years, my mum was unable to walk, unable to talk, unable to swallow, unable to recognise her son holding her hand, the house we were living in, or the life that was passing by our windows every day and by our door. And every time those changes happened, it left us on our knees. Just when we thought we'd found a way or a routine I'd get through each day, we'd wake up and dementia had changed everything. Things we could do and achieve the day before, we could no longer do them and we'd never do them again. It was five and a half years of forever moments. And I think sometimes we get so caught up with work and life that we forget the little things are actually the biggest things to people. I think they're the biggest things. We've all made little decisions today. Firstly, we've decided whether to come or not. We've decided whether to come by train or bus or car or even walk. You've even decided where you'd like to sit and what you'd like to wear and what you'll have for your lunch. But when people start making decisions about you and not with you, it can leave you feeling scared and alone. And they are massive. The morning you walk in with a cup of tea for your mum and she's sitting at a mirror brushing her hair. And a month later you get in, your mum doesn't know how to brush her hair and never brushes her own hair again. That's when we need you the most. Your beauty, your kindness, your knowledge and your care. Or you get in the sitting room and your mum says to you with a smile as wide as the sky above, how's my big boy doing today? And a month later she asks you who you are and why you're in her house. That's when we need you the most, your knowledge, your passion, your guidance and your care. I got up one morning to give my hard-working mum her breakfast and medication and my mum had had an accident. The first thing I knew was that my mum shouldn't sit like that for one single second. No person, whether in a hospital or a care home or being cared for by their own son, should be allowed to sit like that for a second. The standard that we walk past is the standard that we accept. The standard we all walk past is the standard that we promote. And I'm here today to ask you as a son to never walk past. Be a voice for the people you work beside, you care beside. Be a voice for people who may be struggling to use a voice of their own. And I really didn't know what to do at first. Before that, we stumbled through it. When my mum started needing more help to go to the toilet, I used to sit with my back against the toilet door and talk my mum through what to do. When my mum could no longer go to the bathroom by herself, I used to get and help her, but always keeping my eyes closed as tightly as I could. So that I wouldn't see anything my mum wouldn't like me to see. I wanted to protect her dignity, her basic human rights. When my mum started needing more help to get dressed in the morning, I used to put her clothes out in the order she wore them to allow her to get up and be brilliant and achieve and do all those little things she was accustomed to doing all through her life. When my mum was no longer able to dress and undress herself, I used to help my mum get dressed and undressed. But always with my eyes closed as tightly as I could so that I wouldn't see her naked. Because how would my mum feel about that? How would my mum feel about me seeing her in such an intimate and personal position? How would any of us feel about someone seeing us in such an intimate position? So I'm here to ask you today as a son to keep these two little questions within your heart to everyone you work beside and you care beside. How do you feel about me doing that for you? Are you okay with me doing that to you? If we just do it because it only matters to us, we might be failing the people we should be doing it with. And the only thing I could think of doing that day was if I go in the bath and I use a whole bottle of bubble bath, I'd be able to get my mum and all washed and beautiful, but I wouldn't see any of the parts I was touching. I wanted to protect her. And I got my mum's favourite shampoo that day because I wanted my mum's hair to smell beautiful. And I knew that if my mum could, she'd have picked up her favourite shampoo to be the very best she could. And I got my mum out of the bath and her nice pyjamas on and her hair the way she liked it and sat down in her sitting room in despair. 
Out of the good days and the bad days, this was a dreadful day. Am I hurting my mum? Am I doing the right thing? If my mum could tell me today, what would she say about me washing her just now? How would she feel? And I phoned up to get you some help, but we ended up being put on a waiting list. And I don't know where we find the word dignity in a conversation about waiting lists when something like that suddenly knocks on your door. I eventually phoned the GP after a couple of weeks to tell him about predicament that we were still, I didn't really know what I was doing. And he said he would get a district nurse to come out on the Thursday at one o'clock to make sure my mum was safe and give us tips and advice. And I knew she was coming at one o'clock and I thought I'll get my mum in the bath at half twelve. I want my mum to be beautiful the first time she meets this nurse. I want my mum to be at her very best. But I also wanted when that district nurse leaned over to undress and examine my mum, that she would smell that shampoo. And she would smell my mum's beautiful hair. And she would think every time I meet you, Joan, your hair must smell beautiful. And every time before I leave your bedside, your hair must smell beautiful. I wanted to set a standard with a little bit of help and encouragement we could achieve for the last few months of my mum's life. And while I was bathing my mum, the door went. It was a district nurse. She'd arrived about 20 minutes earlier. And I shouted downstairs. I'm holding my mum in the bath. We're at the top of the stairs. Can you just come up? And as I heard her walking up the stairs, I think I cried louder than I've ever cried in my life before. I wanted her to know that I really had no clue what I was doing in the bathroom. And she came walking in her bathroom and at first never said a word. She just took a look at the two of us. She then put her arms around my shoulders and whispered quietly in my ear that she thought I was doing a great job of looking after my mum. And I felt better the second she said it. I thought maybe I can do this mum and maybe we'll get through this. She then knelt down very quietly and introduced herself to my mum. And she showed me how to lift my mum. She showed me how to wash my mum. And she showed me how to dry my mum like a lady. Because I'm sure my mum always dried herself like a lady when she was able to do that for herself. She then said, I'm going to put this in place and that in place. I'm going to organise a wee bed tomorrow. It's got a wee button on it and moves up and down. And I'm going to do all these things. And 45 minutes later, as she was halfway down her stairs to leave, she said the most beautiful sentence I've ever heard in my life. She said, do you know what, Joan and Thomas? I'm going to come here every Friday morning at 10 o'clock just to make sure the two of you are okay. The most beautiful sentence I've ever heard. Because at that moment my mum mattered and I mattered and that nurse mattered. And every one of us understood how much we mattered to each other. And the only way to get through this the best we all could was to care for and about each other and the roles we would have to play. And she's one of the many reasons why this tour's called You Can Make a Difference. As she came walking up our stairs that day, we were stumbling and hurtling and felt we had nowhere left to go. And 45 minutes later, when she walked back down and we were back on a path, we had somewhere to go and someone was going to help us along the way. And if I saw that district nurse today, I'd run across the street and I would shake her hand and tell her thank you for doing that for my mum. And if I saw her again tomorrow, I'd run across the street again and I'd shake her hand again and tell her thank you for doing that for us. But I have to tell you something about her. She walked out of her house that day without even realising what she had just done for us. Because she was just being a great nurse. That's what great nurses do, isn't it? They meet people when they're at their most vulnerable. In one way or another, they put a hand on their shoulders and they help them understand and I hope you are that district nurse. No matter what your role and no matter what you do, I hope that's who you are. I hope it's who you were yesterday. I hope it's who you are today. And I truly hope it's who you are tomorrow. Because the biggest difference to and for for the people that we will all care for comes from the remarkable people sitting in the seats in this room today. This is a room for the remarkable people who have an opportunity to make a difference every day, every person, every time. I can think of no more noble profession to be part of than the profession that there's room still of today that helps each other. It's a remarkable thing to do. And we might not always say thank you. You might walk away from our bedsides or out our front doors or even off the phone and we've forgotten to say thank you because maybe we're scared or lost. And in my case, my heart was broken. But when you do those little things that are absolutely massive to the people that you do them with, we will never, ever forget you. You will be in our hearts for the rest of our lives. 
So I'm going to try my best today as a son to say thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you for dedicating your life to caring for other people. Thank you for doing it yesterday. Thank you for doing it today. And I think you're brave and beautiful and remarkable and most of all kind for getting back up against the greatest odds sometimes and doing it all again tomorrow. I thank you and I celebrate each and every one of you for the job that you do. I'm going to speak very briefly about this, but I'm really proud to say this is that as of yesterday, just over 12,500 hospitals, universities, colleges and care homes, including the wonderful South East Trust here, have got pledge trees and pledge walls, and you can go on my blog and read every one of them. You can click in every hospital I've been, every care home, every hospice, every university, and read a story about the day. I've left some pledge cards on the table there. If anyone wants to write a new pledge today, I'll type it up when I go home and I'll write a story about today and I'll let other people know about incredible people I've met and we matter and you matter and we all care for each other. If you've ever got time, go on and read some of the stories of some of these hospitals and what they're doing with the pledges and informing practice and absolutely celebrating the people that work there. And it's all underpinned by these five must-dos. These are our five must-do with these steps. I think we should be asking each other, the people we work beside and the people we care beside. What matters to you and who matters to you? What kind of information do you need? Nothing about me without me. And be flexible in the services and the relationships that we have. That's the five must-do with these steps if you're asking everyone to think about. When was the last time you asked the person you sit at lunch with every day what new matters to them or you work beside? And that's all about flipping conversations. Instead of thinking or asking people what's the matter with you, ask them what matters to you. Instead of always asking what's the matter with you, ask them who matters to you. I honestly feel that what matters to you and who matters to you are the foundations for the best conversations for the workforce, for the staff and for the people we will care beside. I think it's the foundations for every conversation that we should be having. And it's under the pen by these three principles. Take the time to ask what matters. Take the time to really listen to what matters. And once you've asked and once you've listened, you can share that incredible gift that you've trained for. June the 6th is National What Matters to You Day. We launched it last year in Scotland, 538 hospitals. Uh, universities, colleges and individuals get involved across 23 countries. And if you go on to whatmatterstoyou.com, you can, you can uh, uh, apply for free postcards and posters for your wards and your hospital. And we're asking people to post the postcard back to us and tell us a story about the work they do in that ward. Uh, we're asking everybody leading up to the 6th of June and on the 6th of June to share that hashtag of what matters to them and who matters to them, whatever that may be. There's a report on my blog of what, what happened last year on What Matters to You Day. We had a great teleconference last week with Australia, New Zealand and North America of what they're going to do. And we'd love to hear some stories from this wonderful place as well, if you would like to share them. It's a celebration of the people, how you do it, why you do it, and why we all matter in this room. I'm going to finish with a, a couple of wee things. I never had time to show my film today uh, where you meet the people reading the letters. But people, so many people write to me and they come from a page long to five pages to sometimes 20 pages long. And you get to know how people met, sometimes where they met, sometimes where they went on their first day. In fact, on two occasions where they had their first kiss. You get to know that the night two people fell in love. You get to know how beautiful their children are, the stories of their life, the holidays they went, their jobs, all the things that are make up that really matter to them. And then things like dementia and other things come along and the next page gets harder to read. And sometimes I read the last page and I sit back there and think, I can't quite believe that somebody is sitting in their house feeling like that today. This is a really short letter, it's only got nine lines in it, but I hope you don't mind me sharing it with you. It came in the 4th of March, actually, two years ago. And it contains many of the words that appear in so many of the letters that people say. I have to put my pound glasses on. I keep reading glasses and trees every day. It's a little ridiculous situation. I'm doing. Uh, 
says, Dear Tommy, I'm writing to see if there's anything you can do to help me. I am 80 years of age and my husband is almost 77 and he has vascular dementia. And our life is very tough. It's tough for me both as a wife and a carer. I think he may be in the middle stages of dementia. As I said, I'm finding it tough and there's no one to share or help me get through this. I feel so low at times and so very, very lonely. I need a kind human understanding here. None of my family nor my friends seem to understand what we're going through. Only another carer or someone who understands dementia might know how I feel inside. But you see, we have been married for 53 years and it's such a beautiful marriage. But I'm losing my marriage and I'm losing my husband. Could you come round to our house today please and help us? There's so many things wrong with that letter that I don't know where to begin. <laughs> But at no point in that letter does that lady ask for a miracle. She doesn't even ask for a cure for dementia. She just asks for something that every one of us in this room can be. A kind, human, understanding here. And I won't ask you to, but I'm asked to ask you to put your hands up just now. Do you think you've met that lady in the last week or the last month in the job you've done? I think most of you are thinking about someone right now. How did that conversation go? Did you walk by or did you take the time to listen? Did you have a conversation? If you didn't, do it again today, do it again tomorrow and do it again the next day. If you might want to reflect on how you listen and engage with the people you meet each day, this is a great day to do it. We can all walk out that door today with a different way of listening, a new understanding and share a wee bit more of the kindness we possess in our heart. And I know who she'd love to meet. She'd love to meet that district nurse that came in my house that day because she wouldn't feel so lonely after she left. And I truly hope she'd love to meet every single one of you because after she met you, she would never have to write such a letter of loneliness again in her life. But there's something incredibly beautiful about that letter. It's a love story. We have been married for 53 years. I went to visit that lady four days after I got that letter because I couldn't sleep and I couldn't stop reading it and I couldn't stop thinking about it and I called her up and she invited me over. And I went up and I knocked on her door and she opened the door, invited me in and offered me a wee cup of tea. And I sat down beside her and her husband and she looked over at me with a knowing look and said, you see her? We met 57 and a half years ago. And I fell in love with her and I met her And I've been in love with her every day since. And I just want our story to end as close to a love story as possible and as far away from the tragedy that I feel that we are heading. And if that's not a love story, I have never heard one. And if it's not a love story, I've never stood and read one. And everyone in this room and everyone you sit beside and everyone you work and care beside has their own remarkable story to tell. And if we really are going to truly make a difference to the people we work and care beside, I think we have to get up each day and think, what part am I going to play in the love stories of the people that I meet? I think we should have a sign above every hospital, every hospice, every clinic that says we play our part in people's love stories. Because I think that's essentially what you do at its best, when you're at your best and when you're supported to be at your best. You help people's love stories continue. And I thank you for every love story you've played a part in. I'm going to finish just now and tell you a wee bit about my mum before I go. There's lots of films up in my blog. I've left some pledge cards. I'd love to have spent more time telling you about the wonderful pledge trees. And if you're visiting the South East Trust, go over to the wards and see the beautiful pledge tree and share the stories of the, the incredible people that work there. It's a celebration of people. I called it a pledge wall until Donald Trump started talking about the wall of it too much. It broke my heart. Yeah, it's broken my heart completely. But I, I honestly think, getting up every day and watching breakfast television, I think it'd be sometimes really hard to put your coat on and go and work in the NHS, I think. All the things they tell you. So I'm trying to build a place that celebrates why people do it. Why you got up yesterday, why you got up today, why you get back up again tomorrow. If we don't celebrate that, I don't know how we can celebrate anything. <laughs> if we don't celebrate dedication and passion and knowledge and kindness and care. It's the greatest gift that we all possess, caring for each other. So I'm going to finish just now and try and tell you a wee bit about my mum before I go. 
I would like Andy to leave here today. You think there was a big guy from Glasgow speaking about dementia and incontinence? Because I never came here to speak about dementia or incontinence. I always came to speak about my mom. And my mom's name was Joan. Because dementia does not define my mom. My mom was more sparkling, more interesting, more kind, more beautiful, and more caring than dementia could ever stop her being. It's just that too many people stop seeing my mum and all they saw was the dementia. And they missed out the opportunity to get to know someone who'd have given them a smile, that would have melted their heart, and gave them kindness and care in every way that she could. So I'm going to try and tell you about my mum and I hope that if you ever do think about today, what you're thinking about is a big guy into Glasgow. He came and told us about his mum. That's the bit that matters. So my mum's name was Joan Whitelock. She was born on the 15th of July, 1939. Both my mum's parents died at different times when she was quite young. And my mum's big sister, who was quite a bit older, who went on to have eight children of her own, took my mum in and cared for her. She told her three things. I'm going to care for you, I'm going to protect you, and on the days you're scared, I'm going to hold your hand. And if anybody ever asks me what this caring sound like, I think that's what it sounds like. I'll be there for you. And when you're scared, I'm going to hold your hand. And that was the building blocks that made my mum the most remarkable lady. I was very lucky to be her son. Because my mum couldn't stop caring for and about everyone she met. She knew how much it mattered. She knew what it felt like to be young and vulnerable and alone. And how good it felt when one person said, but you're not alone today. I'm right by your side. And then my mum went out and started and finished school. And my mum's first job when she left school was a training seamstress. And in the wee film I was going to show her, you would see my mum and I out in the garden bringing the washing in. But you would also see us looking at this photo of my mum and dad on their wedding day. And my mum and dad didn't have a single penny to get married. And my mum made that dress and that veil. My mum met my dad, her only ever boyfriend, his only ever girlfriend. And that's a beautiful love story. The day any two people meet and you fall in love for the rest of your life is a story we should all be celebrating and supporting. And my mum and dad gave their children everything and took nothing for themselves. And this will be a room full of love stories like that. That's what your mums and dads done for you and that's what you're going to do for your children. You'll give them the things that are out of reach for yourself. And after my dad passed away I sat in my mum's house thinking, Mum I think you're going to die with a broken heart. You just miss him that much. And this will be a room full of love stories like that. That you've had people in your life that matter so much, it hurts your heart every time you think about them after the gone. But that's why you matter. The people you're sitting beside matter. The people you work beside matter. The people you live beside. And the people you care beside matter. Because essentially we have to and should be and need to matter to each other. But that's where my mum's love story ends. That's when I came back in 2007 and I couldn't keep it going. It felt too hard during too many days and we felt too alone during too many nights. <coughs> but it's also a short description of my mum's life. Everybody in this room now knows a little bit about Joan Whitelock. But everybody in this room now knows more about my mum than most of the people involved in her care or who made a decision about her care in the last five years of her life. Because no one really knows. No one really took time to find out who my mum was who she had been and who she still wanted to be. Nobody really took time to ask my mum what matters to you, John, and who matters to you. What can I do today to make you feel safe or stop you from being scared or make you smile or stop you from being sad? And if we go home at night having absolutely no clue about the people we've cared for or made a decision about the care for, can we really go home at night and say we cared for that person? I'm not convinced we can. But if we take time to find out what matters to you, and who matters to you? What can I do today to make you feel safe or stop you from being scared or make you smile or stop you from being sad? Then we are that district nurse. But more importantly, I think we're part of the greatest story of all. We're playing a part in someone's love story. And every single one of us sometimes, even on a good day, needs a wee bit of help to keep our love stories going. So I thank you for inviting me to speak. I thank you for taking the time to listen. I thank you for your dedication and dedicating your life to caring for others. 
I thank you for doing it yesterday. I thank you for doing it today. And I think you're beautiful and remarkable and noble and incredible for getting back up and doing it all again tomorrow. But I just ask you as I said today, take time to find out what you matters to the people you work beside, you live beside, you care beside. If you do, there's a chance it could change your life. But I guarantee you that if you take that wee bit of time, it will give you the knowledge and the tools and the opportunity to truly change your lives and the people you work, you live, and you do the most beautiful thing of all. You get up every day to care beside you. Thank you very much.